I'll take you for a ride on the devil ship. I'll take you for a ride where you sink or swim. Now come with me and let this story begin. Gentlemen, we needed you for this because the stock market is blowing up in a bad way. It is crashing and burning. I'm losing all my money. This is an emergency meeting, but there are cameras involved. What am I to do? What is the reason behind this? First of all, Harry and Matt, you're back here together this time yes. to talk about the stock market. I have invested uh, most of my earnings in a company that fabricates uh, wicker tables. It was a bad idea. It was a bad investment. I'm now minus $4 million. <laughs> Tell me why. Now, for what's happening? Is this because of the Fed? Like, why is everything yeah. tanking? Is it fears online? Like, what's going on? Matty, you want to go? Yeah. What did you, you think? Know, it's funny because I find even last time when you were on and when I was on, we were talking about the Fed and most people, you know, don't have a real deep interest in what the Fed is. But this time here, like in 2018, this this drop is really Fed-induced because they said we, we put all this easy money to support everybody when, you know, when the COVID pandemic and all of that. And easy it, money is like the, the CERB and uh, just uh, paying people no, to stay home. Is that, that what you consider? That's the federal government. So what, what the Federal Reserve is responsible for is the actual money supply. Okay. So they were actually basically printing money to buy bonds to lower interest rates. That way, you know, your, your mortgage becomes cheaper. Companies can borrow cheaper. And basically, they also just lower interest rates. That's why, you know... You don't get any money when you go to the bank and you leave your money in the checking account. So that encourages people to spend money to get things going. But if you leave it low too long, you end up like we do now. We're getting this massive inflation, which is coming in. And that's a combination of the Fed and what the governments have been doing. But uh, if, if they don't back off, I mean, you're going to start seeing, you know, double digit inflation and you're going to have real chaos. So are people now, this is what I understand is why, so everything tanked, even including like my uranium, uh, whatever you want, even gaming stocks, whatever it's tanking. So the way I saw it is people are panicking and they're pulling their money out of there and they're putting it into what they would consider safer spaces. But what would be... I'm not saying nothing is safer, but at the moment, where is the money going? Where are people investing as well, opposed to the stock market traditionally? Well, you're right about that. They're taking their money out of like what they call high beta stocks, which are stocks that react way more than the market reacts. Risky stocks like uh, these high flying tech stocks. I like high beta stocks. Yeah, they're good. It's like U if Trudeau's on weed, <laughs> it's a high beta. Weed is a high beta stock. <laughs> Uranium is a high beta stock. So all those speculative plays are being destroyed. They are, they're already down, some of them 50, 60, 70% Huge. from their highs. Yeah, Peloton made a round trip from five bucks to, what, 150? Yeah. Back down to like six, seven bucks. That's that bike exercise thing, right? Yeah. I it's, heard people died on those bikes. Oh, I, I put that rumor out there. That's why that's maybe a the stock tanked. <laughs> <laughs> you're short, you're, you bought puts. Yeah, let's right? <laughs> shorten that bit. You know how to play the game. Yeah. He's pulled uh, Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> yeah, dude, is she You're still... the second best investor of all time. She's still uh, making money hand over fist in the stock market, yeah, I huh? think she's. I think they're losing right now because everything is down. But like, there's a rotation happening. Like, you don't just sell something and then you're left with money. Like, they usually put it to somewhere else because no hedge fund, no person managing money is going to just be all cash. A trader might be all cash, but no hedge fund is going to be all cash. So they're going to go into more defensive plays like utilities, uh, safe stuff. Okay. With the uh, value plays, stocks that have low price earnings ratios, things that didn't fly, but are still low. Well, gold didn't fly, right? Gold and silver. Gold didn't. has stayed around eighteen hundred forever. <laughs> Whatever's happening, it's at eighteen hundred. It goes to nineteen hundred, goes down to seventeen, and goes always settles around eighteen hundred. So, what about the people that bought into and they have tech stocks right now? Uh, uranium, cheap. like this guy. Is there is it like a waiting period? Is there something that could be done the next month by the Fed that will alleviate some pressure and then we get back to normal? Or are we going to see this tank for a while? Maybe what's your opinion on that one? Well, the Fed. I think, I think what the Fed is saying is that, you know, our, our, our main enemy right now is, is inflation. So if Which means, they caused. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. They, they overcooked the market. They're keeping things too, uh, too easy, too, you know, rates low for too long. And they're, they're, I mean, you have to read between the lines of the Federal Reserve talks. They talk in economic speak. So most people listening won't get what they're saying, but they're essentially saying, you know, to fight inflation, if it means the stock market's going to have to take a bit of a beating, well, that, you know, the worst, the worst situation is, is high inflation. So we'd rather have the market come down, but we control inflation than the other way around. So, But will that control inflation? The market is down right now. Yeah. Is that going to control inflation? Well, let's talk about inflation. Okay, good. that's a loaded word. Yeah. Okay. There are... Inflation doesn't mean high prices. High prices could be for multiple reasons. I thought it means the the buying power is is less of your dollar. Yes, correct. That's what it is. The okay. buy, if you print a lot of currency, 
Just the act of printing is inflating the currency. This bottle cost me a dollar a week ago. Right now it'd be two dollars, but I still make a dollar an hour. So it's right. twice as... I mean, all things being equal. That's if yeah. I print double the money. Yeah. But let's say I don't print money. I print just a bit, but I restrict your access to that water bottle. There's five people. Five people want water, but I only put one water bottle in the middle of the table. Oof. What's the value of that water bottle going to be? Oh, well, that's a lot more, yeah. Because now everybody's fighting for that water bottle, right? That's a supply constraint. That's a, an economic supply demand problem that has nothing to do with money printing. Money printing played a role, but the fact that the economy is shut down and demand is super high, but supply can't go meet it, that gap is quote unquote inflationary. It's not, it shouldn't be called inflation because inflation should be reserved, that word should be reserved just for money printing that causes high prices. Whereas this is really a supply constraint. I mean, you don't, the Federal Reserve doesn't have to increase rates or anything. All you have to do is turn on the economy and that will disappear. All the supply will come to meet the demand and inflation will go down. But they're not going to do that because we still have COVID. So they have to... Do we though? Well, <laughs> let's say. And what you have to do is, you have to, what the Federal Reserve is trying to do is a crush demand and bring it down. How do you crush supply. demand? What Matthew You said. need the food that you, you need. Raise, you raise interest you raise rates. Interest rates. Food's not the only thing. You don't need a second car. You don't need to buy three sweaters. You can buy two. Right, right. You know, so there's that. But is that really the problem that people have been excessively purchasing? No, not excessively, no. but it's excessively uh, relative to what the economy can currently supply because of all the, you know, the, the shutdowns that we're in, kind of essentially. The, the problems in the supply chain, it's all linked. So be, like Harry's You want saying, him to get closer to his mic? Is that? Yeah. yeah all right. Yeah. Tell him next time. Don't tell me. Or grab your mic and tell us. <laughs> all right. He no. says, get closer. He wants to hear you. No, like like Harry was saying, all all these the, the fact that the supply is constrained is almost a perfect storm. They 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 put out rules or you know this, or the situation as it was reduce the amount of supply that was available of products because you know people couldn't get to work, etc. So you reduce the supply of goods, and then you gave everybody free money to stay home. You lowered interest rates, so you told everyone go out and spend, keep the economy going, but there's not going to be many goods to buy. So like Harry said, if there's only that one bo- you know water bottle for five people. But you're giving everybody cash. Well, the price that the that money is not worth much, but the water is always worth the same to you. You know, so that's the situation we're in. And in terms of the horizon in front of us, would you suggest that people and suggest we can't give advice on this show for stock purposes? But I personally am for certain long term stocks that I had, like uh, let's say uranium. I'm holding on. I'm not going to sell now at a big loss. I'm going to wait till the world looks normal, and then if I see it's still shitty, then I could sell. But right now, the reason why I won't is because. The prices don't make any sense to me because everyone's going crazy. Inflation, people are scared. Are we going to lock down? Are we not going to lock down? So I don't view this as uh, the real end price of what these stocks are actually worth or what anything is really worth. Um, Yes. Like, um, as we said before, a lot of stocks already have a huge bear market. A lot of them got crushed. Okay? You don't see it in the indexes as much. I mean, the S&P is down maybe, what, 10%? Um, The QQQs, which is like the tech stock index, is down maybe 15 to 17%. Those are big drops, but it's not down 20, 30, 40%. Like during the last recession, we had a, a drop, what, 50%, maybe more? When's this? But this isn't a recession. 2008. Oh, uh, yeah. It's like a 50% drop. So, yes, it's not a recession yet. However, by raising interest rates in a time when the market can't really take it, you are signaling to the world that trouble's ahead. We are going to crash this market. You have to. The Fed has a choice, okay? They could either fight inflation and crash the market or support the market and have higher inflation. Those are the only two choices now. They put themselves in this uh, in this um, predicament and they have to get themselves out of this predicament. So if we don't want to become a banana republic, we're going to have no, to no, no. I'm stop not talking, inflation. No, I'm not talking hyperinflation. It could okay, be okay. high inflation, maybe 10%. 15%. That's still a but lot. That's huge. Yes. You, know, yeah. you, you, you do yes. the math of even 5% over many years and, and a lot of your money is gone, your savings. And, and But this this period is not, you know, um, never seen before. If you look at the 70s for a number of years, because, you know, Nixon came off the gold standards, so, you know, the, the value of the dollar fell hard. And for a while, if you look at the market back then, you had these nice big bull markets where the market would bottom off of the lows inflation would pick up and then the Fed would say, oh, we got to tighten rates and then the market would crash 40%. And that went on for almost a decade until in 1982 when they finally raised rates to 20. I mean, imagine we're talking, we're at zero. We're going from zero to a quarter, a quarter percent. In the 80s, what did Volcker bring it to? Almost 20%? Yes. 
And the yeah. interest rates were at 15 and he had to, he couldn't put interest rates at 16. He had to really put it much higher. Yeah. And why, why, what was he worried about then? Because that's inflation. a huge jump. The inflation because, jumped so much. It was Inflation was double digit. It's because if people start to believe, you know, not, again, Fed speak, they say there's anchored inflation expectations. It's if, if I believe next year, everything's going to go by 10%. Well, yeah. when it's time to talk to my employer, I'm going to say, look, I'm, I want a 10% raise in my, my salary. So if everyone starts to believe that inflation is going to be up 10%, that starts to get built into the system and it guarantees that it's going to be up 10%. So the way they finally finished that 10 year back and forth in the seventies of, you know, high inflation, you know, crashing stock market, all then market up was finally, he said, we're going to raise inflation so hard. So, I mean, uh, we're going to raise interest rates so strongly to such a high level. We're telling you, we're not going to let inflation happen anymore. And they broke everyone's expectation. When that finally happened, everyone said, okay, they're really serious at this point. It caused a recession in, in 1982, but that finally broke the, the back of inflation. And we went into the huge, you know, bull market and productive, you know, productive period of the eighties. And it's just, inflation is really terrible for everybody. It makes food. I mean, nobody's really benefiting. Even companies say, oh, they're making more money. Well, no, their costs are going up too. Everyone suffers. There's no real big winner uh, that comes from inflation. It's just a bad thing to have. And it's the result of poor policy. You know, COVID obviously forced a lot of that bad policy. But, you know, this is kind of everything coming together. And it's something we're going to have to deal with. We're going to have to deal with as in uh, you and I. Because what are regular people going to do? They make what they make. Mm -hmm. Prices are what they are. That, that's why I'm saying where do, where do they stand? Do people just have to wait this out? Uh, it's going to be very painful for the average person. Um, the wealthy could withstand it. Obviously, the wealthy withstand yes. a lot. Yes, that might take a hit. They withstand my harassment daily. <laughs> <laughs> but there will be a hit. And that's why, like, right now, uh, Matthew knows this too, is that the, Fed, the Federal Reserve is trapped. Whatever they do, yeah. it's going to cause some damage. So that's why this is going to be a very, very difficult time for the markets. Can we end the Fed? You can end the Fed, but they, you still have to deal with the problem. What are you going to do? You're, the, you're in charge. Yeah. Let's say the Fed's dead. What are you going to do now? You have inflation, not runaway inflation. You have 7% inflation that's sort of staying there. And uh, you have an economy that's slowing down. And people are screaming at you. Prices are too high. What are you going to do? Would uh, if manufacturing being brought back to that country help in any way? It's already, it's already been brought back. <laughs> as much as it could, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Well, because they're trying to bring in the supply uh, uh, chain closer to home, yeah. so they don't have to do with these. They don't have to deal with these constraints from overseas. Before, with globalization, it was good to have your manufacturing overseas because it was much cheaper, and the supply chains were functioning perfectly. So you can get your goods here very quickly, very cheaply. Now it's costing more because there's bottlenecks. It's going to cost take me forever to get my goods to market. So it's better to, if I have a. I, I'd rather pay more for manufacturing here if it ends up costing less. How no. is China dealing with all this? Because China has well, both, China, China's they're been, invested in, uh, in the stock market, they're somehow, which they shouldn't be if they were real communists, but they- Part-time communists. Yeah, they're part-time, they're, they're communists just for the people, they just don't have rights. <laughs> so they, they do so much and I mean, they we're all dependent on them, but they're also inter-codependent on all of us. How are they surviving this? Because I haven't heard China complain. China's pumping in a lot, of, China's doing the opposite, they're pumping Money because they already had a big crash. They're, because of uh, the communist system, the guy uh, Xi yeah. made a lot of dictates. You can't do this. You can't do that. That's what dictators tend to do. Uh, yeah. That's part. Of, it's the, it's in the name. Yeah. So um, he crashed his market already, and now it's very low, and it's almost going to roll over. So he's starting to print a little bit more. He said lower lower interest rates a bit. Um, but China has been at forty percent over capacity, trying to meet trying to produce and meet the world's insatiable demand right now, but the, those goods can get to market quick enough. So you still have inflation. That's what China, China is trying to do, but there's only one cure in my, in my mind. Okay? What in is my it? mind, you have to open up the economy. Yeah. yeah Co okay. Consequences be damned. Yeah. Like forget COVID, whatever, turn, deal with it. But if you do that, then inflation will come down. I guarantee you within two, two months. So if we go about this mathematically, try to put common sense on the table. With COVID, as it stands now, I don't know if there's going to be a super strain next month that's going to kill us all like the Black Plague, but where it stands right now, the uh, under 1%, 0. Point something something mortality rate, um, most everyone's got it here. At least they went all, the Delta went through everyone. They seem to be fine, mostly. The mortality rate of COVID versus the real effects of what this economy, if it continues like this, could do for people in terms of having available food, rent, water, all that stuff. If we lay it all on the table, it seems like the bigger risk would be to keep things closed 
in order to try to adjust that 0. Point something percent mortality curve, as opposed to opening up, we're still going to have that same curve. We'll see what happens. We should protect the vulnerable. But allowing people to get back into their lives, and then there's going to be less people affected, less kids that go to school hungry, less people that are just strapped for cash. So on common sense grounds, it seems like opening up would save more lives than locking us down. Is that extreme for me to say, or is that what it seems like on paper? Why Why is that extreme? I don't know. That I'm just asking because I... I, I'd I'm say not, you, have to, yeah. you have to do a cost-benefit analysis. You know, it's funny because uh, that's why me and Harry get along so well. We've had so many th- these discussions even pre-COVID. I remember once we got into this heated discussion and he was saying, Matty, look, if, if, if it was really just deaths that, that counted most, he's like, why isn't the speed limit, you know, five kilometers an hour on the highway? You know, because because you could reduce, you know, motor, there, there's, there's always a cost-benefit. Yeah. Nobody wants anyone to die needlessly, but there's always a cost-benefit analysis. Like, sure, if you make it, you know, five kilometers an hour, there, there won't be any accidents, there won't be any deaths. But then the highway system doesn't work anymore. Yeah. You know? And I mean, like, yeah, you have supply constraints. Truckers are driving five kilometers an hour. Exactly. They can't get their goods to the market. Yeah, yeah. same thing. So now the food prices go up. There's, yeah. there's different costs. And so then there's, so you have to always weigh everything. So I think I'm hoping, you know, now two years in that people are starting to realize that there has to be also be a cost benefit analysis to the rest. Cause it's not, this hasn't been a short term thing anymore. It's not three weeks into this problem. Yeah. You're two years in. And I think you have to look at everything in society and all, all of the problems, you know? So, um, I'm hoping we can get to that point. What about crypto? How do you guys feel about that? I think it's over. <laughs> you think it's officially over? Or you don't think it's going to no, be a I bounce back? Crypto is the like the most speculative speculative asset known to man. So it's going to fall the hardest. I think NFTs are. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I, I think a bunch know, of chimps. You know, <laughs> a bunch of shiny chimps. I don't have faith. Berets. I don't have faith in crypto because I don't understand it very well. And I don't like putting my money into something I don't understand. And by the way, you're a very smart man. Uh, both of you are. And you know the stock market pretty well. You're, you're, you're intellectuals as far as I'm concerned, especially when it comes to money. And if you're saying I don't understand it very well, <laughs> it's so funny that I have doofus friends that all assume they're experts in crypto. Yeah. I don't know. But you know what I think it is, is, you know, I follow some guys, some really smart guys. And they were saying, you know, crypto today is what the internet was in the early 90s. It's, it's the Wild West. You know, are we still using Palm Pilots? No, we're using, we're using Apple or Android. So... Even if the, the technology is great in this crypto, you know, you know, the blockchain was invented, maybe some coins will be around in some capacity in the future. It's, it's almost like be certain that the vast majority are going to fail. I mean, how many tech stocks from 1994? I mean, Netscape Navigator is not what I used to go on the internet anymore, you know? So AOL, I, you know, AOL, right? So, and, and they were, they were, and AOL. they were huge. I mean, AOL was the, the dominant player. We, America we, Online, baby. America we don't go online. China Online. Come on. I got my CD in the mail. I yeah. have my four hours of free internet, you know? <laughs> and, you know, so, so even crypto, people have to realize that, you know, these, you know, buy and hold blindly, even if the story is great, just te- technological innovation is going to probably put, 99% of these coins out for sure. Just it never, that's if the rest of them survive, but you have to know it's going to be huge turnover. That's for sure. And I heard there's a country, uh, Central America, what is it, El Salvador, yeah. that switched to uh, Bitcoin? The guy's yeah. like 38 years old. Yeah. But the IMF came out this week and begged him, said, dude, for the, for the good of your country, get off Bitcoin <laughs> standard. And then uh, during that same week, uh, everything tanked. <laughs> and they're like, we fucking told you. Warned you. <laughs> but then again, it's all, it's all fee- even the fiat currency that we use now, it's all nonsense. So yes. to tell someone, oh, Bitcoin is stupid, it's so not, is the shit we use. It's not nonsense. You know the difference between Bitcoin and the dollar? Tell me. Is that the dollar is backed by force. You have to pay taxes in the dollar. It's by decree. Like you, you have to pay your taxes in dollars. Yeah. So there's an artificial demand already built into it. You there's need no, dollars in order to pay yeah. X things. So that you, you have to work, yeah. earn dollars, pay taxes. And that's it. That's the only thing. It's all faith. Ba- Everything is faith based. Okay. Yeah. I mean, even gold. It's faith based, but it's proven. Like, it is. Whoever holds it can trust the other person. Doesn't have to trust the other person, right? Unless you like screw around with it's the uh, composition. Yeah, yeah <laughs> tungsten inside. But like, there's problems with everything. Okay. There's like we were talking. Matthew just saying it's a cost benefit analysis. What's the best benefit uh, given the costs? So now we see that. Ever since 1971, when Nixon went off the gold standard, we have been living in a dollar standard, a fiat currency standard. And the, the inevitability of this is to increase the debt load because money is created as debt. So you eventually are going to get to a point where we have so much debt in the system like we do right now. And you just can't print your way out of it. You, in in uh, the 80s, Volcker was, a lot, was able to raise rates to 18 20%, whatever it was, uh, because the balance sheets at that time were very low. Like 
the the debt to GDP of the U.S. was like thirty percent. But even now, extreme. Now if it's you like raise one, one thirty, one forty. What you can't, we're so indebted, we can't do what Paul Volcker did without seriously destroying Hurt, hurting people. That's what I'm saying. This is so. The only way out now, whether we like it or not, is the system is going to get nuked. You know, there's one one person I, I love to follow is Ray Dalio. He's he's the you know the head of the biggest hedge fund in the world, uh, Bridgewater Associates. He just had a, a book come out, The Changing World Order, and I, I think he's a lot. In my, I'm a lot like him in a sense. He loves history. He loves to look at how cycles happen in the past, and the way he looks at the world, he's like everything's already happened. It just may not have happened in my lifetime yet. So this whole book was is to go back to see how empires or countries over time evolved, and we're at a point now in in our debt cycle where things can go really ugly or like he calls it a beautiful deleveraging. So basically you have to get the level of debt down. And I think that's why the Federal Reserve wants a little bit of inflation because whenever you have a bit of inflation, it, it eats away at the debt. So if I owe you $100, but the, but the money gets, you know, inflation happens. Well, the $100 I give you back is not really what it was worth when it's going to be easier for me to give back because it's not really the same value as it was when I took, took the money from you. Right. So it's a matter of how to get from where we are with all this crazy debt to a point where we can lower that to an acceptable level without blowing up the system in the, in the, mean, in the meantime. And COVID, I think, was a huge wrench in that. I think they were, they were starting to maybe achieve that a little bit. Uh, but now we're really in a precarious situation. So I know some people, like, they ask, you know, what do you think about this or that? There's so many incredible, huge variables out there. Is COVID going to come back? The debt, the Fed, the stock market. The if COVID doesn't come back yeah. and we start slowly easing our way into some semblance of n- normalcy, can we get out of this without people getting, um, you know, financially nuked? Yes. Yeah? But you're still, yes, in the short term. you still be kicking the can down the road because debts will still be accumulated. You still have to deal with a huge debt. It won't be as catastrophic as it could be. So what do per- people have I to do individually? Up. Sorry? Like, what do people have to do individually? Because back, I remember when I was younger, the trick was they would tell you, be careful as you grow up. Credit cards are very easy to get. Don't let them trick you. Don't fall into debt. If you put something on your credit card, make sure something you can pay at the end of the month or two months, whatever, so that you don't fall into that trap. Now, individually, is the best that people can do to save themselves, try to minimize their own personal debt as much as possible? Or even if they do that, the way the country's structured, the country's fucked, they're going to get screwed anyway. From Protect themselves from what? Protect themselves from, from inflation? Per- yeah, from, yeah, exactly. How do, you, how do you protect yourself from inflation? Yeah. Well, classically, is to own a little bit of gold, physical gold. Or to own real but assets. But not everyone's going to own physical gold. You, you can own real assets. Now, real assets. Are you talking about real estate? or Real estate. Okay. Um, so let's say Montreal, oil? for example. Sorry. Montreal. Yes. Two years ago, right before uh, the pandemic started, it was actually plausible for a lot of different segments in the community to own real estate. The way the prices are now, people who are reasonably well off would have trouble purchasing real estate on the island. Yes. So that's why I'm saying we're getting to a fucked up place where even even if someone on paper two years ago was like, yeah, of course you can get yourself some real estate. Now they can't. So in order to keep themselves safe, th- their options are limited. That's why I'm saying, what can people do? It's. I just had this conversation. Sorry, I just Not had this nice. conversation. And we were better off during those times in the 70s and 80s where interest rates were 11, 12% mortgage rates. Mustaches were bigger. <laughs> yeah. Good time. People were thinner. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So think about it. Like, if I told you, like, what would you prefer in terms of real estate? If you want to buy a house, would you like to pay a one percent interest rate, or would you would you rather pay an eleven percent interest rate? What would you say? Personally, yes, I prefer one percent. Yes, yeah. but I'll give you an example. Back in those days, the interest rates, let's say, were eleven percent. Okay, they were at one point. Okay, and the mortgage you would get a mortgage for eleven percent. Let's say. Okay. Uh, but houses would cost maybe two hundred thousand, and you would make maybe fifty thousand, forty to fifty thousand, and a house would be let's say five times your salary. Yeah. Okay. That's reasonable though. Reasonable. Yeah. Right? But interest rates were eleven percent. Let's say ten percent, so we can make the math easier. Yeah. Okay. Ten percent in that scenario compared to getting one percent now in the house is, is uh, a million. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. But see, they're inversely related. You lower yeah. interest rates, the price of the house goes Correct. up. Correct. So I mean, it's you have to kind but of. Pick I your feel like the way it went up was too high. Like it was too quick, at least. <laughs> yeah. I what, think it was just years? too quick. No, 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 no. In the last two years, yeah. dude, it's I've noticed it. I've seen. Yeah. I've seen it go up. Yeah. Like it. I in my lifetime, I've never seen such a jump well, uh, in front of me. Because there's different ways to value a house, right? Yeah. So there's demand supply, but also. 
there's let's say replacement value. So because of all the supply constraints, you know, uh, lumber prices went crazy yeah, through the roof. Yeah. So now someone's gonna say, okay, look, maybe my house is worth eight hundred thousand dollars, but hey, if you want to build this house now and go buy all that lumber, it's gonna cost you one point four. So I'm not selling my house for less than one point four. And so there, there's different there's different levers, you know, like when you have to price your house, and and that's why all this not only did rates go down, but then after with all this, you know, the supply problems, and plus people wanting to probably move out of you know, very dense high rise condos to like suburbs and there's not many homes to, to accommodate, you know, the more space that that's like the perfect storm for this where houses went up 50% in two years, which is, cr is crazy. And, and if you think about it, but can that ever adjust, can they go back down or they are what they are now? Cause the way I was thinking people are like, ah, oh, houses will go back down. But then the more I thought about it, I go, well, why would they in the sense that let's say you just bought a house that was high priced back in the day would have been 400,000. You bought it for six. Why the fuck would you sell it for anything under than six? It doesn't make sense. No, but then what would you buy if you sold it? What do you mean? Like if you sell your house for a million dollars. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. It's a million dollars. Then what do you not have I to live I think it's somewhere? all relative. It, it's amazing. Well, it's a million dollars if you got a good, but if you bought it at 1.3, the selling it at a million is not amazing. No, but let's see. I bought it at 1.3. Yeah. Okay. And I sell it. I realize the money and I have to live somewhere. Yeah. I have to buy something else will also cost 1.3. I'm not better off. No, but I'm, I mean, there's another way too. There's a really good economist, Thomas Sowell. You know Thomas Sowell? And he had a book when the housing market, blew, you know, kind of blew up in the states in two thousand eight. And and I, I, I was thinking this the same line of thought as you guys were, but he brought up the point that there's, there's also a certain amount of, of people where they don't need a house. Yeah. So you know, right now, you know, look in New York City and in, in the apartments, people are going to share four or five people in this apartment. Well, if interest rates go down, they want to buy a house instead of five people in an apartment. Maybe you have three, so two people move out and buy houses. If if let's say people buy these houses, but then they lose their job. And they say, oh, no, I can't afford this house anymore. They're going to say, okay, let me sell my house and move back into an apartment with somebody. So there's a certain amount of the demand that can go away with people living back together. Maybe people, 25 will say, I'll live back with my parents a little bit. Or someone says, you know, uh, instead of getting divorced, uh, we're going to have to make it work because we can't afford individual homes. So there's, there, there's that part of it as well, where if enough people say like, well, you know, I lost my job, there's a recession I, I got to sell my house. I can't afford it. I'll just have to move in with someone that, that can bring housing prices down, but historically it's rare to see that's what i'm saying it's, I don't it's got to be a bad situation like it's just rare to see can it happen it happened in 08 in the states and that's why it but happened. that was a that was a crash that was and, th th that yeah. was the worst case scenario right, so here right. too if we crash obviously they'll, they'll go down but i'm saying the way we're going now if this maintaining and people are waiting for the housing market here to just crash it's a bubble it's gonna go well, if we continue the way we're going, why would it, unless there's a right. forced, a crash, why would it? Why would you who just bought something for 800000 why would you sell it for less? It doesn't well, make sense. In 08, what caused that crash? It was the Fed who said, we're going to raise rates, we're going to raise, and he raised it, they raised it multiple times. Wasn't it also because they were pulling these goddamn pyramid schemes on those, <laughs> uh, on the loans that they were giving out? Yeah. Strippers <laughs> buying five, five yeah. houses. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Yeah, but what, that, what, that was the bubble. But what pricked the bubble was when the Fed kept raising rates and then it made it so expensive they couldn't afford to, to pay the down payments or their monthly payments. So that's why the Fed raising rates goes back to why is the stock market weak? Why is it, raising interest rates affects everything in society. Like the Federal Reserve is so powerful. People always think about the president or, you know, the prime minister. The Federal Reserve, the Bank of Canada is so powerful. This one, this one you know, unelected person can come out and completely change the lifestyle, the the economy, your 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 standard of living for everybody in the society. So it's a really powerful mechanism that people really don't understand. This and is, right now, what is not, Canada doing? Well, this is not, Maddie's right. Like they are so powerful. This is not a free market system. This is not a capitalist system. This is a centrally planned system, especially when they control interest rates. Like you said, it's so pervasive, so powerful that it it has shockwaves across everything in the economy. What's the other option? Let the interest rates, let the market decide interest rates. How, how would that work? By people buying and selling uh, bonds and the, the rate will settle at a certain, certain point, whatever the economy is. Like if there was COVID was happening, right? And they blew the interest rate all the way down to nothing, okay? They did it mechanically, but they waited for a long time to bring it back up or they haven't yet. Maybe if this was a market-based system, it would have already been going up three, four months after, okay? Because based on what market participants want to do. Because interest rates are the price of money. Okay. You know, so, so they're setting what the price of money is. So when COVID happened, they lowered interest rates. They did it like like uh, Harry said mechanically. It would have happened anyways because I don't need a lot of money to open up a, a factory when the whole world's shutting down. So if I have any extra money, sure I'll lend it to you for for whatever you want to give me because I have no use for it. Yeah. Then as soon as the economy would come back online, slowly but surely there'd be more demand for money to expand and do things, and that would naturally raise the price of money, which is interest rates. And yeah. uh, correct, it it's, would like a, it's like a bottle of water. You're 100 percent right.
So who would, let's say, uh, Canada, right now we have the Bank of Canada that dictates the interest rates. Right. If, let's say, there was a government that could abolish that, what would happen from day one to day two? What would that look like? It's very simple. It's like, if you take the Fed out of the equation, yeah. you just have the market participants. Like the Fed just buy, the Fed manipulates interest rates with a, uh, open market operations. Okay, They go into the market and they buy and sell bonds to reduce or increase the interest rates. They buy bonds to reduce the interest rate and they sell bonds, treasury bonds, to um, to uh, decrease the interest uh, to increase the interest rate. Okay, so people will be doing that instead of the Fed. If I have a demand for a treasury bond, a lot of pension funds, a lot of like money market funds, a lot all these things, people. Banks, I've never bought bonds. I don't really understand no, you're, what they you're are. You're too small. Like a big player, big institutions will do yeah. that. Okay, and that the interest rate will settle at a at a point like the price of water. Why is the price of water one dollar? It's because supply and demand meet, and that's the price. You People are willing to pay. Yeah. That's and if water becomes rare at one point, let's say coffee. If coffee becomes rare, the bean we couldn't have a good bean harvest. So then the price of coffee will go up. It's called my nightmare, sir. <laughs> but the thing is, you see, it's such an incredibly powerful tool that that's why they, they won't give it up, right? But, but you know, the market system is like a, is a modern marvel. We, like, no one gives enough credit. We, we go about our lives. You get mad at these greedy capitalists. But think about it. it the market system, like, think of Amazon.com, right? The uh, pandemic happened. The government didn't bring you food. They bring you clothes or whatever you needed. Private industry did. Private industry brought you all that. He built because he wanted to make a profit. And it was the most efficient system ever. In the middle of the pandemic, next day delivery. Try and get a, uh, a COVID test and you're waiting out lying in the cold, you know, with a bunch of sick people like, lined up together. Yeah, so. anything the government runs is normally a little screwed. And I have something to say about this because I had an argument with someone. Because I had, a lot of my economic views, as you know, are very libertarian. Mm -hmm. uh, I like freedom. I don't like people manipulating. They, I don't like behind the scenes secrecy, especially in things that concern me or the public. I think they should be in the forefront. But you're a fringe. So, you're a fringe. Uh, right, apparently, right I'm a terrorist winger. at this point. <laughs> I, I like freedom, uh, equality. Uh, that's these are bad qualities to have in society nowadays in Canada. So, people always bring up, well, if it really was a libertarian society, which we try to lean towards, let's say even the states tried for the longest time to lean towards actual freedom, who, the, without the government being in control of everything, who would build the roads? They would say. And the more I thought about that, I'm like, well, first of all, that's already a fallacy because the government doesn't build the roads. Trudeau, Biden, they're not fucking landscaping. You always have to hire, someone's going to hire these private companies. Yeah. Now, whether it's you and your community that you work together and you pay into, or if it's the federal government as it is now, it's never the actual federal government. No minister, no uh, governor is out there with a fucking shovel. This is nonsense. It's complete. No, it's always private industry. But also, if you look at it, it, you know, the bridges or a lot of highways sections, there's tolls. There's ways to pay for that. So even though it's, yeah. it's, it's government run, but even that's always the argument a lot of people will bring up whenever you talk about like less government. Who's going to who's going to build the roads, you know? You Whoever builds them now, no, just that not, you're gonna have to pay them directly. But not just that. Like, why? Why go to the most extreme situation? There are so many other problems, steps in steps between that we can solve before we figure out who's gonna build the neighborhood road. Maybe yeah. the contractor who develops the land has to build the road too. I mean, that's not that far of a stretch. It's still yeah. privately built. But like, let the private sector do as much as possible, and everything will run smoother, better, more efficiently, and that makes every, everyone better off. Look at the past 100, 150 years since since like free market capitalism really dominated the world. If you go back, you wouldn't even believe how people lived 150 years ago. It's unfathomable. And it just happened by people getting together, buying, consuming, and enjoying. And, and we all became so much better. I mean, look at, look at Berlin, the best example ever. You had a wall dividing West and East. One side was prosperous to this day. It's, it's still more prosperous you know, per person. And the East was broke poor. It was just the same people, same time. You put up a wall with an ideological difference. That's a great... Uh thing to point out because that's something because we always talk about how would we ever test this how would we get two samples been tests. you'll see it in real world There's we see it in real world right now yeah. but people say oh well, it's a different it's a different country we actually had culturally it was the same people yeah. divided only by political ideologies and we saw the difference yeah so i don't know why we still keep playing this game uh we, we keep teetering towards a system that we don't want a system that the East is using right now, like China's using, you know, we're teetering towards that when we've seen that it's never been successful. Why are we taking a it chance? It sells well. It's easy. It's an easy. Socialism is an easy sell. Uh, I think the, the word is good. Is sell. I think the word is good. That's people, cause I love socialism. I love being social. I like helping my neighbor. I like that stuff. Yeah, the word Grassroots. The word is amazing. Mm -hmm. But then when you think about it applied in practice, it's like, no, 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 you're, you're going to help me be in charge. And then I'll tell you what you can do, what you can think, how much you could consume, where you can go. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on, what's so social about this? Well, I, 
I don't like the concept of egalitarianism. It, it's, it's the most, to me, it's extremely evil because then why should somebody who worked harder than you have to give his money to you who just and you're just sitting there doing nothing. You need a meritocracy based on individual value because the individual value in society is always based upon what you can provide. In other so example, in society if there's a meritocracy, let's say here, the the highest paid employee is going to be the one that produces more. In the way we're seeing Galtarian, then the highest paid employee is also going to be the lowest paid employee because everybody gets paid dick. Because we all have to be equal. But there's no incentive to be. There's no incentive, no incentive to be better. Highest, highest productive. Yeah, exactly. And also, what's the point? What if when you need? What I tell people is, you need extra sometimes. You need, you need the option to be able to work overtime, in order to adjust for your kids' braces or something, an emergency. Imagine being told, no, 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 you can't. This, these are your rations for the month. This is all you're getting. You were human beings. We should be able, with the sweat of our brow, to create something. But well, I, you can create if you're gal- if you're egalitarian. Exactly. No, but yeah. I, I would say that most of the. Um, insults that are hurled at capitalism is not being thrown at capitalism. It's being thrown at crony capitalism, yeah. which I don't agree with. I mean, if, I you, if you have a billionaire who's paying off politicians so he can get lower taxes or, or access to land that others wouldn't, that's a different situation. hundred percent big pharma, big, t- exactly. all the big that, that that's infiltrates. Not capital, that's not that's capitalism. Not ca- that's I totally tell people because then it becomes yeah. an oligarchy. That's government stepping in. Like and, we have here in Canada, the, the, the three big telecom companies. Right. That's not a free market. Dude, that's borderline. It's going to be communist. That's borderline one big company controlling everything. They they had fought with the government to stop, uh, I think it was uh, Verizon that wanted to come in here. Verizon, yeah, that's right. A few years ago. That, uh, when, they, when there was talk of it, like the stocks were taking a hit, the uh, the different telecom stocks, because Verizon was going to be able to muscle in and, and, and lower prices. Because at first they said, we're not going to lend them our infrastructure because a lot of these telecommunication mm-hmm. companies, they share the same infrastructure. So then I think it was by, Verizon. By decree, by law. You have to, yeah. So then what did they say? They went, they lobbied the government. No, we're not going to give our stuff. They can't use our stuff. So then Verizon said, all right, we have money. We'll build our own infrastructure. To which they lobbied the government again and said, make that illegal. They can't build new infrastructure. And the government said, okay, you can't. So then they had no business being here. So I said, fuck off, we're not so coming. So tell me, how is that capitalism? Exactly. Yeah. That's communism. That cap- that's insane. <laughs> you know, it's, it's supposed to be free market capitalism. That's, that's the real uh, secret for success. And so, so that means free market. You can't have, you know, a group of three guys or three companies uh, basically controlling the market. What do you want, Poseidon? You're, you're looking at us. Oh, no, I was going to confirm that it was Verizon. It was Verizon? Yes, it was Verizon. <laughs> and they went and bought Vodafone after, and they said, okay, forget it. They bought the, the remaining they went to Europe. Vodafone, yeah. Okay. And uh, I remember getting into arguments with coworkers, because I had some dumbass coworkers that were like, "No, what am I gonna do? My commission work." I'm like, "Your your commission is gonna get more competitive." Yeah, you need that. You need that. You'll be able to to go work for Verizon if they don't pay you well. There you go. Yeah, people. You go. A lot of people good. don't get that. People didn't understand that. Like, I was like, "How do you not understand this?" Like, well, it's. I noticed that. I told you guys. I noticed it here this week with. Uh, so the laws changed. Uh, they said essentially in Quebec, if if you're a store that's bigger than 1,500 square feet, in order to get in, you need uh, the vaccine passport. Now, I, Poseidon, we have these passports. We refuse to use them, okay? So Poseidon went on an investigative mission to Rockland Shopping Center, one of the big malls around here, nice mall, we like it. I had went the day before to get a haircut. They didn't ask me for anything, so I got my haircut. He went the day after, and he noticed that it was dead. And every big store he was going to that was asking for the pass, he wasn't giving it to them was dead inside. And then that got me to think, because some people were happy about it. Some people were like, yeah, we're implementing this, it's great. They're signing their death certificate. That's all they're doing. Because the more people can't go shop at these places, what do you think, I'm going to starve? I'm not going to have shoes? No, I'll just go online. Meaning Amazon, the big company, is going to make money, they're going to thrive. You and the middle company is going to shut down. And the guy working the door has no more job. So he's laughing about it now, but in a couple of months, a couple of weeks, depending on how long this goes... You're done. And there's no more uh, SERP. The government's not giving out any money. So now you're going to have to get back on the market and do what? Everything's going online. You're, you're killing yourself. Without, these businesses are killing themselves without realizing. Well, ideology trumps reality. It's crazy. They don't know. It's, it's, it's absurd. They're, they're pouring gasoline in their home. Like, I hope nobody lights a match. And then they're like, light a match. Someone tells them, look, all right. I hope nobody drops this match. The government's like, drop the match. All right. Why is my house on fire? It's, it's insane. You know, then I, need, I need the government to take... To take um, to take my house off of fire. I can't even say Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, yeah to call to someone to help me house, yeah. put out the fire. It's absurd. But you know, I think Harry and I, you know, we, we both traded for years and we had to live off of our trading. And when you trade for a living with the market, you, you become aware that what makes sense and what should be is not reality. And you have to adjust for that. I think 
because of our, our unique background, we're used to thinking critically in that way. And a lot of people, like I, I speak with my cousin, they say, oh, why would they do that? It doesn't make any sense. People don't always do what makes sense. I mean, look, mm -hmm. at, look at the USSR, right? I mean, the, the, the country was a, a terrible place to live for so many years and so many people suffered. And, did it make sense to do it? No, but that was the ideology. That was the drive of one person. So it's not always what makes sense is what's going to happen. And so uh, I think people have to realize that. And some, when you, that's why when you see something that doesn't make sense, you got to speak up and say, hey, this doesn't make sense. Because if not, it'll just be in that train of motion and go in the wrong direction. You'd be surprised how far that can go. I've been trying to do that here. Uh, in Canada, there wasn't that many people. That's why I'm happy with the, the convoy, mm -hmm. what they're talking about um, here in Quebec. It became, I didn't notice until a fan pointed out to me. He goes, you know, you're one of the very few like artists in Quebec that are actually saying something. Like a lot of people are avoiding trying to say that it's because they're scared to get labeled, right? They're scared to be, if you say the mandates are wrong, they're scared to be labeled anti-vax, you know? I got vaccinated. I know I'm not anti-vax. It's not do with that. The mandates are stupid. Then they say, why don't you follow the science? So then I regurgitate what the scientists are saying and what the World Health Organization is saying, which I thought that's who we were listening to a year ago. That's what Trudeau said. He says, I'm listening to the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization just said something that he's not doing, he's disrespecting, and then he's saying, we're following the science. So of course I'm going to speak out about this. It's crazy to me. You keep moving the goalposts, you're making this up as you go along. Why is my question? Because there's no way there's a legacy somebody wants to leave behind. Our, our, uh, the stock market is in shambles. My housing market is, is an insane bubble. I don't know if it's going to ever pop or what's going on. People, Inflation's on the rise. What's the end goal here? How is this going to help anyone? I can't see, no matter how you view the economy, how this would benefit anyone at this point in the next five years if we continue doing this. Unless I'm crazy. To me, it seems egotistical. It seems like I know I'm wrong, but I can't admit it. But that's government. Like Sometimes they start off with what is a good idea. They want to help save lives or, or you know mm -hmm. lessen the, the impact of COVID. But... Government's a very sloppy, slow machine. So even if the original, uh, you know, intentions were good, after a certain amount of time, they could just be heading in. Like, I mean, now it, the goalposts, like you said, just keep changing. Originally it was, you know, once everyone two weeks, then it's, you know, get vaccinated and this. And, and now it's, they're not even testing people anymore. And now it's hospitalizations or it's that. So they just, it's just. It's, it's with a, as opposed to because of COVID in the hospitals. Yeah, it just it's keeps a, changing. Yeah. It's such a clunky machine. Sketchy. But one thing that bothered me about the whole thing from, from the beginning is trust the science. I, I trust science. But that would be like me, anyone, let's say I have an opinion on the market and someone has a different opinion. I say, trust the, trust the, fan, trust the finance guy. I can be wrong. Yeah. I mean, like science. We saw that with this. We, we saw that happen with some scientists that, and all of us, we were wrong. We believed one thing. Same thing with the efficacy of the vet. But science is a testing mechanism. Yeah, that's science it. is not a, a black and white forever thing. I mean, we used to think that, you know, the sun revolved around the earth. We figured out that's not, that's not true. So I just having that ideology of follow the science, don't ask any questions. That, that's kind of counter to what science actually is in the first place. I mean, it's, it's not that you shouldn't listen to doctors, but to have this blinded ideology. Of it like, starts becoming religion. It starts you, you becoming well, culty. You end up yeah. becoming anti-science in a sense, right? I mean, yeah. so I don't know how well, you're, you're, Yeah, you're I agree. Thoughts. It goes back to the point where I believe, like, for most things, the problem is central planning or too much government. Okay? Same, same. I don't like too much so, government. So, like, if you have people, like Matthew was saying, you know, trust the science. Trust Who says that? No real scientist would say, trust my science. They would say, here's, here's my, my findings. This is my hypothesis. These are my findings. Can you verify it or can you shoot me down? That's science. It's not somebody like, uh, like Fauci or, I am the or Tam who says, I am the science. Like you can't question me. No, that's, that's when you have, that's not really science. That's science married with politics. I am the podcast, Harry. Yeah, I can't <laughs> say, well, I'm shut down. Yeah, yeah. But do you, you know what I'm saying? It's like when you mix science with politics, you get politics. Yep. You don't, you ha the real science is observations, experiments, uh, verifiable evidence, and then prove that, prove that experiment wrong. And if it is, then you change your mind. You have no ego in there. Exactly. You know? And when you use that kind of like dictate of science, like how many times has Fauci changed his mind in, in two years? Yeah. Like 50 times? Uh, Which so he's allowed to do. Of course. <laughs> but then you, you can't be, imagine the f every time he's so, so certain that he's right. And then he switches and goes, now I'm super certain that I'm right again. Switches again, I'm super certain and you have to follow my dictates. It's like a yo-yo, we're going to go crazy. And that's why people are starting to say enough is enough. I understand what's happening. Let me live my life. This has to be over. We can't have another two years of this. Imagine having another two years of this. I can't see a reason. And inflation and like, the market's going to zero. I people are going to, yeah. you know, like, what are your thoughts, man? No, I, I think whenever people shut down discussion, if you go back historically any any time, 
it's because either they're hiding something or they're scared of something. There should that, that's, that's why free speech is such a, a pillar of our organization. I mean, I, I love to travel. You know, I, if you go to Florence, there at one point there was kind of like a little revolt and, and a monk or a priest took over Savonarola and he had all all the books burning that wasn't religious and it had to be this and he took over like a basically like a dictator. Why are you? Why are you? Why are you? Why can't you allow discussion? If you're so right, I mean, like I'll discuss my views on the market with Harry. I'm confident, but I could be wrong. I yeah. mean, sh explain your ideas and. I think you would have a lot less, um, you know, frustrations in the population, a lot less anger and uh, dissidents. If you would talk to people like they were intelligent, you would explain the situation. We may be right. This is what we're trying to do. But trying to shut it down, like this is all it is, you just create distrust and you're not being a good leader. A good leader inspires. A good leader doesn't shut down everything else and everyone else and it's this. Label them. Yeah, label them, call, insult them, you know, like... Uh, I, I just think if it's science, you should be very transparent. You should show the data, like Harry said. And then after, if, if you are wrong, that's fine. You got new information. And, and yeah. that's, that's what science is. Same with, with finance. People ask, what's your what's a good stock pick? Well, this is what I like today. But if tomorrow, tomorrow yeah. the Federal Reserve jacks rates by 10%, I'm going to change my mind. But that's being a financial, that's being an investor. So I think you just have to, that's just what they've stopped doing. And I think that's a really big problem that has to change. I agree with you guys 100%. I mean, I've opened up, I've sent invites to the premier here, Legault, for French, and Justin Trudeau, like uh, right before the elections, right when they were on the campaign trail, for an open discussion, try to win me over, not, uh, hey, fuck you, get on here. It was very, and neither of them, neither of them would ever come close. But it's not like they don't do media. They do shows. They do the shows that don't question them. They do the shows that it's goofy, that they're allowed to dictate, which to me, a free country is crazy. Not that they have to do mine, just... Don't do any. Go on and speak with someone else. Just you in Ottawa with another professional. Discuss. The fact that they refuse to discuss is shocking to me when we have all these platforms. When you can go out there and speak to people, it's shocking to me that we're leaning towards this and that there are still people that are okay with that. They go, no, I need someone to think for me. Why? But, but even if he goes on those uh, uh, softball platforms, yeah. he still gets himself in trouble because he's so at ease and he calls yeah, the last opposition month. racists and yeah. misogynists. He called a bunch of Punjabis white supremacists this yeah, week. So he'll it was still, amazing. He'll still, <laughs> it's crazy. He'll still get into trouble even if he does that. So, Yeah, that was the best thing when he's calling a bunch of uh, uh, Indians, Pakistanis, like these white, white supremacists. supremacists. And like, have you, you met a truck driver? Like maybe out west or what? I don't know. Every truck driver I know here is Indian. What are you talking about? What the hell is he saying? It's just, they're grasping at straws now because like, oh, this is bad. People are going to start figuring out. So I'm just going to label them so no one takes them serious. But that's why this convoy, that's why all this is happening is because they're losing the, I think they're losing the faith of the people because you, now, and this is the problem when, you know, like like we were saying before, trust in science, don't ask questions, is like Harry said, you make it political. So then after, rather than adapting to new data or new information, you just you just reinforce your point, even if, if it's wrong. And, and that's the worst thing you could have is you're in a pandemic, everyone's trying to figure out the best way out. And now you have a politician playing politics rather than playing, you know, science or, or what's best for the general population. And I think that's what you're seeing, you know, and if, if, if the mandates are not logical, people can see through that. I mean, well, they didn't for a while. There was a lot of arguments. There's trust. People trust that the government has your best intentions in, in mind. They know it's, it's a fluid yeah. situation. It keeps moving. But at a certain point where like, for example, with the nurses here in Quebec, where they said, if you don't get vaccinated, you're fired. That's insane. I mean, for two years, you were our frontline heroes. Thank you so much for, for we didn't know what this virus is. We didn't know how deadly it was. And it let's not work. forget understaffed for years and yeah. underpaid for what they were doing. And they came in and then suddenly they said, well, now this is the rule. And the, the biggest irony is they backed off and then they said, okay, now nurses who are infected with COVID can still come to work and we'll figure out a way. Uh, so, so if it's as crazy as what you're saying, then yeah. why would that be allowed? It's all, it became theater. And, and this week though, I think the mask fell off Trudeau big time. Because he got mixed up with what he was saying when he said we're following the science. So the World Health Organization announced, uh, I forgot what her name is, that woman that does the announcement now. She said for, they can't see the benefit of children between 5 and 11, of uh, the risks outweigh the benefits of getting uh, jabbed. So you shouldn't do that. Denmark followed suit. This was today that they announced it. We're not mandating uh, children get vaccinated anymore because of the new information. And also they're starting to lighten, they're, they're taking the foot off the pedal just like other countries around in Europe that are taking the foot off the pedal. He knows this now. He has this information. He has this new information from the World Health Organization. He's seeing other countries do it. Instead of saying, hey, guys, there are updates. It looks like things might start loosening up. You know, we're getting... Doubles down. Mm -hmm. Calls the people that are also saying, hey, reduce the mandates. Calls them crazy, white supremacists. So which is it? Are we following the science or are we following the Trudeau? Or whatever it is, because some, some other governments are doing the same thing. There's, uh, for example, Biden was trying his best to mandate things that the Supreme Court said, you can't. 
You don't have that type of authority. So then he said, well, individually, I hope that the companies do the right thing. We'll go directly target the companies so that they can do what I say. Yeah. But why if it's against the science and it's against the law? Well, this is the danger about of government. You need government. Even capitalism has a government, right? Mm -hmm. It's not it's not anarchy. It has a small government that is, def that is uh, constrained by what it can and can't do. But when you... They realized back then, the founding fathers did, that if you get government too big, it gets, it, they want to hold on to power. Yeah. Power corrupts, and uh, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And that's what you're touching on. Like, in the beginning, he was trying to do the right thing. But now he's just making dictates left, because he doesn't want to be wrong. Yeah, you know? exactly. Like Trudeau and, uh, and Legault, all those guys would make bad traders. Oh, because yeah, Because they yeah. never admit, you have to admit you're wrong, and then move on and do something else, you know? If you can't do that, then you're not, you're basically, you're, an autocrat, I think. Like you have to adapt to reality, not your real, not your truth. Yeah, I hate the, the truth, your truth, you know? yeah. especially when we see other countries, Ireland to the UK. I think they're talking about now. Uh, the UK opened up, uh, but that's maybe because he had a problem. Uh, Boris had a yeah. uh, Boris he had got a caught he got breaking caught. his own rules, having parties. Yeah. Uh, during uh, but lockdown. Trudeau did the same thing. Trudeau did yeah. the same thing. I now there's photos of him partying massless, but everyone else is the problem. It's little things like this that get on on my nerves. Uh, depending on same thing with the malls indoor outdoor it's all it's theater and it bothers me because a lot of people don't see through it and they still panic they're anxious they're scared they think their neighbors going to give them something trudeau just said because he doesn't want to deal with the truckers that he thinks he has covid so he needs to isolate he if the if it's true he's got three he's got three jabs mm -hmm. against a strain that the ceo of pfizer said is uh I, the jab is useless against the delta so even that's theater yeah I mean, but yeah, the Omicron. So, oh yeah, sorry, yeah, the Omicron. So what, what are we saying right now? I don't understand. If you're you're asking people, you're forcing people to get this or else they can't work, but it doesn't work. So what's why are you even arguing? Why don't you just let them get back to work like normal? If it's true and he's not lying because he wants to avoid them, if it's true that he got sick, then why would they want to take it? But see, the frustrating thing is, like I said earlier, like risk-benefit analysis, you're doing things. That's why I, th I think they're starting to lose the trust of the people. Like, for example... For the longest time, you couldn't go into small stores not to spread COVID. You know, you're in a smaller space. Now in Quebec, they said uh, more or less to punish people or force people to get vaccinated, saying that you can't go into big box stores. Yeah. You know, obviously, that's where everyone sh does most of their shopping. So now, so now, what science said that big box stores with better air circulation are dangerous, but smaller stores with poor ventilation are is, not the place, dangerous. is the place where you should be going. So I, I just think it's... You have to trust the science. Yeah, yeah. This, well, is, this is what you guys said. This is ego. They, yeah. they've and that's the problem and, yeah. and and like i said maybe in the beginning it was, it was all good intentions I'm, I'm hoping it's still all good intentions i've publicly said this i've said for both trudeau and lego in the beginning mm -hmm. i don't envy their position i did not envy their position it was an unprecedented event and i thought even the stuff that they did that in retrospect seems excessive and dumb they did it coming from the correct place they did it in whoa i'm gonna try my best to try to fix this mm -hmm. i believe that their intentions were noble and they did the best they could at that time now, what, what I see is just ego. I see the science says you're wrong. They refuse to admit it. The people aren't happy. They say you're wrong. They refuse to admit it. So now we've fallen past that noble act into I can't lose any face. They don't realize that they're just digging their heels and they're losing more and more face because more and more people are waking up to none of this making any sense anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't, I don't ascribe a nobility to those politicians at all. I think politicians are, they do whatever they will do to get elected, period. Correct. Yeah. It is very selfish. I mean, because it was so crazy at the time, I, I I hope to God that no one at the time was thinking re-election. Because when it happened, I wasn't thinking a year ahead. I was thinking, okay, day to day, what, what is this? Well, Trudeau did call an election in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah, so there yeah were, that was, there was a bit of a dick move. Yeah, that situation. was a dick move, yeah. There was some political yeah. motivation there. Actually. Yeah, okay, you're right, yeah. No, but even when the pandemic was raging, the smart thing to do is to institute like restrictions because people were scared. Yeah. That would help them get re-elected. If he did the opposite, he said, I don't care. People say, hey, you don't care about our lives at that time. Yeah. So he did the politically correct thing. Not politically correct. The, politi the politically correct thing to get reelected. The politically motivated thing. Yeah, to get reelected. You know, so- And even at every, that, his reelection I, now, I believe 30% there are, of the- That's yeah. for him to go out and dictate. 30%, you know what that means? That means that if, if some idiot like me oh, actually 30%. ran for another party and was popular enough, a single guy could have beat you. What are you talking about? 30%? That's absurd. With a very low turnout. Yeah, that's why I'm saying so it, it's it so embarrassing. It's it's nothing to... It's like, yeah, we did it. I'm the man. What are you talking about? The majority of people didn't vote. This is crazy. This is fucking crazy. This guy... Anyways, I, I, I wish for the best in terms of us moving out of this. 
But when egos come into play and it's other people's lives and livelihoods that you're playing with, it is a very dangerous game. It is a very dangerous game and more and more people need to wake up and realize that right now the heroes, are, they don't want to say that it's, but the real heroes are and have always been the the doctors, the nurses, the truckers that are bringing your food, the people that work at restaurants. Remember when they were making food, chefs, cooks? Yeah. We didn't know. They didn't know what's going on in the beginning. We didn't know how dangerous it was. they were still making stuff, just dishing out delivery. All these people, those were the heroes. Even the cops that worked and were going place in the beginning that didn't know what's going on, they're like, well, we still have to police, right? Anyone in the beginning that was working and still continues to work now under these conditions for society. I could do without a Trudeau and a Biden. It will affect me zero. However, try to live your life without having your food delivered to you, yeah. without having doctors available when you go to the hospital. Try living. These are the important people in society and we're not protecting them. We're Every couple of months, we find a new criminal from the hero class. So now it's the truckers. They're making the, a few months ago, it was the doctors and nurses that didn't want to get, they were the, the evil ones. The, the only people that had balls to face yeah. this head on in the beginning. So you're always shifting. Soon it's going to be Border Patrol. If Border Patrol says, you know what? We're cool with everything. We don't want to check the Vax Pass. They're going to be villains. They're, there's always going to be a villain and it's never the government. Yeah. That's what I'm seeing. If it's crazy, it's yeah. crazy, but because I don't know anymore. It could be me that's an extremist. Well, I mean, the old saying is, you know, um, absolute power corrupts absolutely, you know? So, I mean, we've been under, it's almost two years where the government, because of, you know, the health situation has basically full power to do whatever they want. So, I think it's natural for politicians to try and hold on to power. Like and I, I said, forgot I, teachers. Uh, yeah. Teachers too, remember? Yeah. They didn't know in the beginning they were saying kids are spreading it and they were still going to school. Mm -hmm. That's another thing you don't say thanks for. Shitty, poorly ventilated schools. They don't know. They're like, oh, I'm going to wear a mask. I don't fucking... And they still went and did it. The working class that actually got out, those were the heroes that kept the country alive. And these buffoons are the ones trying to take credit and reduce their lifestyle, ruin people's livelihoods. Uh, unacceptable is what I'm saying. Unacceptable. What is your solution? <sighs> I'm not going to pretend that I have the best solution, but r the first solution that I think is necessary and it's only logical is the m we have to stop with the mandates. I think companies, if they want, we found so out. You, right now you're the premier. I'm the premier. What are you going to do? You have absolute power. What I lift the mandates. Uh, the, the mandates are lifted. First of all, there's no forced vaccination in any first world country. I would never subscribe to that. If I really think, and right now I can't, even if, let's say right now the vaccines were not what they are. The vaccines are 100% effective. Even at that, I won't be able to force, but at least I would try to convince, hey, these are the stats, this is what's happening. That's not what they're doing. The vaccines aren't good. They're leaky vaccines. And still they're trying to mandate them. Of course, people are going to get mad at you. Of course, people are going to get mad. So no, I, I would try to educate if they okay, were. So let me play. So this is what I would do. Hold on, hold on. I just want to say advocates. one thing. I would number one remove the man the mandate for that. Okay. I can't make it. Uh, I would reopen the stores. You're allowed to go wherever you want. I would start putting money into healthcare because we've been understaffed and underfunded for 20 years with actual real plans on how to incentivize doctors to stay here. Why uh, on, to incentivize nurses to stay here and make money? Like right. Open up a private system as well. Is that what you're saying? I believe there should be a private system as well because right now we've seen that the public system isn't working and it hasn't worked. So unless you tell me that the government can manage it and prove to me because so far they haven't been able to, you need a private system. But if I was to do that, I would change our structure and the way we pay healthcare now and what we get. So why not, if people are paying into a healthcare now that doesn't work, why not take that money and pay into a private insurance for everyone? Same difference. The insurance companies are making their money. It's just not coming out of someone's pocket directly. It's going through their taxes and they're covered. Anything to give them what they would need to be able to go to the hospital and get the help that, let's say, an American hospital has, which people talk a lot of shit. I've been to American hospitals. Bro, the wait time is eight minutes. Uh, they amazing. have everything they need, and they'll take care of you. And then, they, oh, what if you're not insured? Well, here we're insured by the government. We shift the insurance policy just to make sure that it goes towards the private industry as well. A anyway, so I would uh, do I, that. I wouldn't say insured by the government because our taxes are uh, in line with the, uh, the insurance <laughs> that we get. So okay, we'll pay for it. Yeah, well, also... Uh, we're forced into it here, which is a whole different matter. Even if you have private insurance, you're still forced into paying into the government, which is why it's weird to tell people you have to pay an extra tax if you're not vaccinated to go to the hospital to get treated. But why would I pay an extra tax? I'm already paying. It, it doesn't make any sense. They were also going to uh, bar the unvaccinated from going to the hospital. Mm. Like they don't pay tax. They haven't paid taxes for 20 years, paid into the system. I and made when, that argument. When they get sick. What, are you gonna, what Am about, I entitled to all that money back? Yeah, that's a, or what about people who are uh, who are let's say obese, worse, obese, worse than the unvaccinated because you can control obesity, alcoholism, mm -hmm. um, tobacco, cancer. Yeah. So what we deny 
health care to these people who have paid into it through their taxes. And who have been model citizens as far as we know. Yeah, that's how you want to run your society. Okay. But that's what I'm saying. That's where the ego comes in. Yes. Because a reasonable person would have sat down and been like, all right, let's look at everything on paper. Why are people so against it? And it's like, well, the CEO said, uh, Pfizer said this doesn't work. Um, three jobs won't even work. We're looking at the mortality rate of people that are vaccinated and unvaccinated. The mortality rate has stayed the same. We're saying that the um, uh, the condition when they're at home or in the hospital might change. But I know people who have been vaccinated and non-vaccinated, they went through this the same. So statistically, we're still the same people in critical condition. And they all have something in common. Five or more comorbidities. So... We're not. Well, that's a good. That's a very good argument. Like everybody's talking about how disproportionately the unvaccinated make up a bigger percent of the people who are in ICU. Well, it's actually fifty fifty percent, but because the unvaccinated are like twenty percent of the population or fifteen percent of the population, yeah. they are overrepresented in the ICU. Okay, but that could be a case of uh, correlation, not equally causation. Because there are you, you are you looking at other factors as well? For example, recent statistics have shown that. Overwhelming majority, 90% plus of the people in ICU are over 60, so old, with at least three, and 75% of them have four comorbidities. So that is the case for all of them, whether they are vaccinated or not. So vaccination, vaccination status might not even play a role That's in what we're being seeing in the now. ICU. If you're, if you're old, excuse me, if you're older, if you're overweight, if you have hypertension, if you have... a, a um, uh, cardiac problems, if you're I immunocompromised in some way, yep. uh, diabetes, all that kind of stuff. Diabetes is a big uh, huge. danger. Yeah. That plays way more of a role in people in ICU than whether vax or not, because it's 50-50 vax. And these are statistics. These are not wishful yeah. thinking. This is what the science is telling yeah. us right now. I would I would, I would, would uh, uh, put forth the notion that if this a test was done, vaccination status as a variable in a regression analysis would not be significant. The other factors would explain at, at least, the other facts that I mentioned, the comorbidities plus uh, age would probably explain 95% plus of the reasons why people are in ICU. Well, that, that's why I was so frustrated. There was a recent press conference uh, with uh, Legault and, and he, you know, so someone asked about, you know, I think, you know, are people with COVID or, or uh, dying of COVID? You know? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's like, you know, it's not easy to figure out. We're still trying to get those, those kind of numbers. Well, we're two years into this. I mean, it's, it's like it's like you're asking me, you know, analyze this company, but I can't see what, what kind of sales they have, what kind of earnings, how many store openings they had. Just like, you know, like that's a big problem on your side. You're supposed to be the data people. How, how are we going to make a decision without data? Why are you not getting that data? Like even like Harry said, let's do, do some regression analysis. Let's find out more stuff and i find that very frustrating that well look one of my friends i i yeah. they they know him anyways he's i, I don't want to give him away because he might want to talk about this on his show or he might want to come here and i don't want to divulge too much but his girlfriend who is a doctor um because he was very very pro whatever the government says in the beginning because of all the extreme shit that was coming out like the microchips and all, remember how crazy that shit was 5g so because of that, he went the opposite the route. 5G. They were saying that the vaccine has, uh, oh, okay. 5G is causing, uh, okay, I, didn't see, it, I, didn't, I didn't see that the one. The most insane yeah, shit ever. Yeah, yeah. So he went the opposite. I was like, look at these imbeciles. So he's like, fuck, I'm going to follow the docs. I'm going to follow this and that. And recently, uh, about a month, he started to get frustrated with, he's like, I'm not going to get a third one if it's not fucking working. And I already went through it. I'm, why am I forced to get a third one? So started asking questions. And he got into arguing with his um, with his girlfriend about this. And then she confirmed with him because at one of the press conference, he goes, this doesn't really happen in the hospital. There's no with uh, COVID and cause of COVID, and she's like, yeah, of course. He's like, what are you talking about? Why would you give a, f why would that be a statistic you go with if it has nothing to do with the, the reason why they died? She's like, well, that's what they told us to do. So yeah, we document this. And he found it, and that's, he called me, he's like, dude, this is insane. Why, this is crazy. So someone, you could just say, yeah, yeah he died with COVID, and you're assuming he died because of COVID, yes. and it was a motorcycle accident, but yeah. when they tested him, when he got to the hospital, he tested positive. He's like, this is crazy. I too thought for the longest time that this was a conspiracy theory, it wasn't real, until doctors are like, no, no, we have, we, it's part well, of the statistics. Like, but I think because you get money, if, you, if you're in the hospital, you get like, I know in the States, I don't know here in Canada. I don't know how it works now. But you now. get money in the, if, you, if you identify the person who has COVID, even though he's not there for COVID. One of my best friends growing up uh, moved a couple of years ago, started a family in uh, Seattle. And he, it doesn't matter where he does the hospital, he's, he's got a good position at the hospital. But he told me this when it started. He goes, you know, we get paid for every positive person. Mm -hmm. And he gave the example, he goes, dude, we have an old guy here. They've tested him this week. And it was when the test didn't have the rapid ones, it was a stupid nose, the one that hurt. He goes 12 times. He goes, 
always ne- they're trying to get a pot. I go, why would they? he goes? Because fuck, they get money for each person. He goes, I'm seeing he the the craziest shit he goes in in hospitals. And in the beginning, he wasn't sure what was really going on. He goes, I understand if this is real or not. He goes, we've we're, 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 we want people to get it so that we get the money. That he goes, it's fucking insane. No, hospitals need the money, so they're going to do anything to get the money. Yeah. But you see how perverse the. I don't know if that happens become. here though. I don't know if they, they get incentivized. Sure. I don't. Know. I never asked. If it is, it's probably hidden. Or something like, I don't know. We don't have the, honestly they mismanage the money. We don't have, money. We don't have money to give the nurses. But you see again, like sometimes it's it's um, yeah. it's a noble idea. You say like, look, you know, you're dealing with a, a patient who has who has COVID. It's a True. disease, so you know we're gonna, we're going to compensate you for the additional risk you have. But again, that's how sometimes something that you mean well ends up going in the wrong direction because you're creating incentives. You know, like Charlie Munger, the legendary investor, he's like, you know, show me the incentive, I'll show you what the person's going to do, and that's that's just part of human nature in the system and. And so, like I said, two years into this, we should have data. We should have that information to make I agree. You know, greater d- data. You know, like um, that's the frustrating part for me. That's where I get very frustrated. Where I get grounded is when I speak to guys like you because I'm uh, I'm a comedian. I'm emotional. I'm a fucking Greekster. So I like speaking with people that are their entire life is more based on statistics and rational thinking, you know, more calm thinking as opposed to emotional reactions like I do because that's my barometer of whether or not I'm too dumb or crazy about this. So when I come, because there's a lot of stuff, let's say me and Harry will disagree on and we could talk about it. And then I'll, um, yeah, it's true. If I sit back and and analyze, yeah, he has a point. But things like this, when guys like you agree with me and you guys took more time to sit down and think about it, that's when I see, okay, there's a problem here. And the word needs to get out. People have to start asking questions because the slippery slope argument is always made. I think right now we're in a very dangerous, precarious position with the slippery slope because we're talking about creating new laws in a first world country that mimic that of uh, third world countries that don't care. We're, we're close to defranchising people. People are very on the edge of losing their businesses, uh, their jobs, the future. How, I mean, how much money do we have really to give into unemployment if 50,000 truckers would go uh, out of work? First of all, who's going to bring the stuff? It, there's so many levels to this and we're teetering that more and more people need to wake up and just stand up. Because alone, the government can't... What is Trudeau, Legault, what are they going to do if the cops aren't with them, we're not with them, the truckers aren't with them? Then they're just talking in the wind. We have to stop just agreeing, nodding our heads and going with it. That's why I don't know if the police unions would ever think about this, but at some point you have to stop following orders. But there are people who like that. We're, 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 we're in a bubble here. We agree on most things. But there are other people who would say to you, they would say, "I'll play devil's advocate." You know, yeah. you want you want to open up the economy, okay? What, what aren't you afraid of killing grandma? I'm not. What's your answer? Okay, so but the truth, I'll to- tell you why I'm not. I love grandma as much as the next guy. However, anything could kill grandma. You're asking me to choose whether taking a risk of something t- that grandma, who's immunocompromised, could die from anything, would die from this, let's say, and then risking millions of other lives. No, but see, I disagree with you because. The way I look at it, and this is why I, I kind of thought it from the beginning, is is if if the elderly women are the ones who are most at risk, instead of having all of these economic problems that's messing up the whole economy, why don't you just target them? Take what would probably be just a fraction of this money and give them everything they needed. If you see people who are seventy and older are at the highest risk, you want food delivered this afternoon, whatever you want, no charge. Like like do everything you can to make their lives as easy as possible. It's cheaper and, and safer. Yeah, it'll be safer for them because they're going to get the direct care they need. It's safer and it's and the rest of the population who wants to can go about their lives. Yeah, that's the way I look at it. But I mean, that's private industry thinking right there. Well, that's different than what the government, which is bandaid for all. It makes complete sense. You're right. Like I would think that just to go a little bit, not off topic, but topic adjacent. Um, If the government, let's say, didn't offer financial incentives to hospitals for identifying COVID, would we still be in this mess? I don't know. It depends what hospital you go to. Some hospitals uh, aren't really suffering. We're not giving, the government's not giving you any money for identifying anybody as as a COVID patient or not. Is it going to be as hysterical? Are cases going to go up? Like like asymptomatic cases? Oh my God, it's going to be COVID might not be hysterical, but the hospitals will continue being hysterical because... uh, uh, let's say one case that I know of that even when she had, uh, she works in the ICU, an ICU nurse, even when they had two people in there, it was still a lot two because uh, two uh, COVID patients in ICU. Okay. It was still a lot because they're not the only people that need ICU and they were two nurses when they should be 10. So people forget about this is like when the nurses complain. Are you saying in Canada? In, right, right. This is, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm 100%. not going to say the hospital because I don't want to get her, in, but this is here. So, 
when because a lot of people they, they don't realize who's at fault so they'll look at nurses and be like oh they're always bitching but they're nurses that's their job this and that. what you don't understand is they're not saying i don't want to do my job what they're saying is in order for me to do my job for x amount of people there needs to be x amount of me right now there's two of me but there's still 10 patients let's say overall it is impossible for me to give the care that needs to be given with me being, um, have a quality of life, you, you know, a normal quality and understand what the fuck's going on. So this every day for years, for years, it gets too much. Right. So the problem is not that there's so many people being infected in their ICU. That's not the problem. The problem is we don't have enough people working in the ICUs because we've mismanaged the system. We fucked over the people that are working in there. And then whenever it's convenient, we blame them. Oh, they just don't want to work. Oh, this and that. It's What are you talking about? They're understaffed, underfunded for years. So how is it their fault? But see, that's where, where, again, the politics comes into the situation because, I mean, I don't want to speak to everywhere, but here in Quebec, for example, you know, uh, Legault keeps blaming unvaccinated people because, they're like Harry said, they're a bigger proportion of the hospitals. But there's two sides to that situation. The other side is that why is your hospital capacity so low? Yeah, I that's mean, the, that, but that's, that's what they're saying. That's your responsibility. And... And it's always been a bad healthcare system here. I mean, we've always, every winter, it's always, oh, don't, you know, the flu, Even for flu, the season, flu. flu season, don't go. It's, you know, the emergency rooms are 150% capacity, you know? So I'm saying before you just cast blame on one side of that situation, well, what about the other side? Out of, we're, what, 8 million people in Quebec? Why at 3,000 patients is the system shut down? The you know, ICU that, nurse that I know here that's working, I'm telling you she's going to have PTSD because of this. Because she was, yeah. a month ago we were talking about it and she broke down just talking about it because... For, so she she saw a lot, she saw people die. Remember yeah. the, incu, the intubation period, all that we were given. She saw people die during this time. Young people, whatever the fuck it is, she's seen a lot. And it's already the ICU, so you're never you're not gonna have people come in there happy. Someone has an extreme yes. thing, whether it's COVID or so. And imagine overworked years of this. Now you're like, who's failing? Is it that people aren't getting vaccinated, even though eighty percent of it is it the government's failing? You don't know where to put the blame. All you know is that you go to work and you're told this is your team. It never is your team, so you take over everything. Uh, it's always overtime. They're going to find ways to fuck you out of pay. Uh, then when they had new people, they had an incentive in December or November. They said all the new nurses coming back, if they come back to the public sector or private coming in, they get these bonuses. But the people that were working for the two years weren't getting any of that. So there's all this mental fuck and all they see is just death and despair. I am telling you, there's going to be a huge segment of our uh, medical uh, population the people that work there that are going to have fucking PTSD like soldiers in a couple of years. All they've seen is just crazy shit yeah. for two years and they can't go home. They go home like eh, two hours later, take a nap and come back because there's not enough people working. Do, do you remember Legault like five years ago when he got elected, he promised that he was going to expand the private part of uh, medicine so he could alleviate the, the stresses in the they system? Prom all they, they do is do promise. anything. Because they don't care. Yeah. They don't really care. I, that's what the, the thing I've noticed is that they don't have empathy. The, that's why it's cool for them to shut down, let's say, uh, lockdown. You can't go see your grandmother during Christmas. Leave her alone. It's better for her to be alone. They don't care. They don't give a shit. That's what we have to understand. People keep thinking that title dictates behavior. And if someone's a premier, a president, a prime minister, because of the title, their behavior is going to be in line with that title. It never is. They're human beings. There's a lot of good human beings, a lot of shit ones. There's a lot of smart ones, a lot of dumb ones. Well, this is what we fall into. Yeah, I could say I could talk for hours about the medical system, the problems involved, and even when even Legault said there's no problem in Florida because they have a private system, you know, like for all the, they're not overwhelmed, but yeah, but they're also doing like what the Rogan thing was saying. They're also doing early treatments. They yes. take it seriously. There, so many factors you can mention. All these things are like Rogan. Rogan is correct. Like he's he's like the he truck. Is. He's the U.S. truckers. Yeah, even That's though it. they're trying to paint them whatever brush they want, if you actually listen to the people he has on and listen to what they're saying, all they're saying is. They never said it's fake. They never said all the stuff they see in the media. It's fake. He's not saying, look, we have treatments. I use them. He used them. He All the famous people he goes, use them. People called me. So all the celebrities are allowed to have them. It's cool for them. Then when he says, maybe regular people should have this too. They're like, look at this fascist. Look at this idiot. He, It's so stupid. It's yeah. so dumb. Yeah. And then you have Rolling Stone magazine who was trying to play like higher than now. They were even talking shit about him and Jordan Peterson together. Look, look at these two dummies talking. <laughs> Dude, Rolling Stone magazine put... Do you remember when they put the Boston bomber on the front cover because he looked pretty? That. And they're going to dictate, they're going to dictate what uh, moral value is in society. Get the fuck out of here with that nonsense. <laughs> I, I refuse to get played by any of these cocksuckers anymore. Yeah, that's one thing I, I also, again, that with all of this is that it's been years of, you know, we have to accept everybody. And then there's a lot of good to that, you know, but, but and now suddenly it's, it's become acceptable to shun people if they don't agree with you yeah like it doesn't matter if you're a minority or whatever it is if you don't agree with the, with the the general it's like oh, you are out you're shunned you're done no questions asked you're out you know so I, anyways it's just it's amazing how quick 
uh, the tide can turn in, in how people uh, act to things, you know. But in terms of stocks, before we leave, so that people could know, what would you recommend they do if they have any free money right now? Again, I, not I, stock I, I, advice, but just okay. We can't give advice. Yeah. I can't give advice. I don't know. You, do you have the qualifications? No, no. It's very rare to have. The, they don't let you give. Uh, we advice. used to. Have, we used to. We, let, we. I think we let our uh, our designations lapse. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm telling you, like right now, it's a very for the lay person, it's a very dangerous time to be in the markets. Okay, it could be. It could. It could become very, very bad. I'm not saying like maybe. Personally, I think we're going to have a a little upswing coming up because it's been so bearish. It's going to be an upswing. But I'm saying overall. Like this is a very dangerous time to be in the market. So a tough I would year. be tough yeah. year. It could be a tough two years. Bear markets destroy everyone. They destroy bulls and bears. Bears would go short in a bear market, and they have these crazy rips, and they have to cover. The biggest rips in in, in market history happen during bear markets. So they destroy everybody. It is a very terrible time to be a trader in a bear market, whether you're a bull or bear. So I'm just saying, be very very cautious. Uh, don't buy in, into these meme stocks. That's dead. Yeah. It's over. Sorry, if, uh, if Poseidon. Rate, if rates go up, uh, meme yeah, things every, go down. Everything is, if rates go up, yeah. everything is going to get killed. So just be very, very... It's not bad to be... If you're a trader, you can be 50 to 100% cash. is not a bad idea right now. And just wait your time. Wait for your moment. Like if you, But for an investor, a, a, a late person, I would say just do what you normally do. Just dollar cost average into stuff over time. Go into your work. You know... Um, what portfolio you want to do, that's another whole story. But I'm just saying, like, don't panic. Uh, but don't, this is not 2020. It's going to have to be, it's going to get unwound. What, those excesses of 2020 are going to be just as bad coming down again. It has to. So I'm just saying, this is a very, very difficult time to be a trader. I know, I'm eating market. it. I'm eating it right now. Yeah. What about you? What, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree overall with what Harry's saying. You know, I've been, like, cautious since November. So, I mean, for, fortunately, I missed you know, the downdraft didn't hurt me. But I, I one of the things I, I like in terms of uh, this year we could have a lot of potential is kind of like along the conversation we had here, if a lot of the mandates start to come off, like look at the UK overnight, bang, back to normal. If that were to happen in the US or, you know, other major, major it would, uh, countries. Everything would spike up. Well, not necessarily the market, but I think oil would, would have a big run up because I think, you know, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, there's, a, there's a legendary investor, Peter Lynch. He used to be, you know, he was ran a huge fund of Fidelity for years. He's like a, extremely successful his thing was he would buy things that he would he would see around them were popular. His wife would say, "Oh, I, I bought these new uh, uh, pantyhose or something." He say, "Oh," and he would find out the company and he say, "Wow, this is a great story." And that's that's how he was his edge, how he was so successful. So if I if I try and apply that to today, I think everybody is tired of being at home and ordering off of Amazon. Everybody wants to go see their friends, see their family, fly somewhere, go on a vacation, go play some sports, get somewhere. So if the all that is oil, if the mandates come off, that demand will come on instantly. But the supply won't. It takes time to come on. And the oil companies, last year, and sorry, not last year, in 2020, oil went negative during the pandemic. So a lot of these, these companies were under severe strain. And so before they say, oh, I'm going to start pumping more oil, they want to be sure that not only is oil going to stay here, but oil is going to stay here for a while. At one point, Harry and I were uh, investing, we were doing some private funding for some uh, gold mining companies. And we were talking to the CEO. He was saying, look, it's not just the gold price. You know, he's like, before we get money from the bankers to expand the operations, you know, the gold price has got to stay high enough, long enough that they're going to believe that it'll be there into the future. Because if, if we fund the new operation, then prices fall next week while well, you won't be able to pay us back our money as bankers, right? So so before the oil companies, you know, bring a lot of supply back on, oil prices are probably going to have to go higher or at least stay higher for longer. And if that demand comes in, I don't think that supply is going to come on anytime soon. So I, I think this year, and that's the general sentiment I get, is that the mandates are going to start being repealed. If you look at what the World Health Organization said in people's general sentiment, I think, uh, and that'll be another negative for the general economy, because if you see oil go back to, uh, you know, triple digits, 100, 110, 120, 140, plus the Fed's raising rates, look, you're back to the 1970s. You have you have a stock market falling, inflation's pretty high, oil's going up, and that's not a fun economic environment. So I agree with Harry, you want to be safe. I think one of the places on the upside, potentially, would be oil. That's where I'm, I'm focusing at the moment. That could, again, always change tomorrow if things change, but that's my general uh, idea so far for 2022 that I'm looking at. All right, I like it. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. And just so you guys know, it was actually a request. Uh, two people said, hey, get your uh, stock guys back on. What's <laughs> going on? And I was like, fuck, it's true. Yeah, this is the best time to bring it back on. So you are well liked. Uh, your links are all in the description. I know you have a master class out. So the links are there if anybody wants to buy it. When are you starting your master class, sir? I guess I'm not a master yet. Uh, yeah, you, master. You, you, you're a master. And it's good because you guys complement each other. You're big into stuff that he's not big in, vice versa. So together, you make the ultimate portfolio team. 
it's funny, you know. We've known each other for so long. Oh, for so long. He's like my best friend. He's like incredible. He's an incredible investor, incredible trader. So, yeah, you should get that course. Same with Harry. And, and the thing that's awesome about Harry, why maybe, you know, I like to do these podcasts is if you want to test your ability for critical thinking or debating, go up against Harry. Because yeah. over the years, I remember when I first started working at the bank, we'd have discussions and you'd ask me these simple, like where they're loaded questions, but simple questions, you know. And, and as you know, a young guy, I thought, yeah, I know the answer. Then he's, he'd throw all these other questions at you. It's like, whoa, I, I got to think a little bit deeper. So yeah, yeah. in terms of critical thinking, Harry's uh, really helped me to uh, up my game. That's for sure. Same, same. He's very good for that. So yeah, links are in the description. Follow them both. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Advocated by sin We're selling plastic dreams Try one for free